My name is Matthew J. Mary. I've been a lawyer for 45 years. I was born in Little Italy. But when I was brought home uh, to 146 Mulberry Street, which is located on top of Angelo's Restaurant, which is still there today, the San Gennaro Festival was in full swing. And I was carried through the festival uh, by my parents. I, I knew early on that I wanted to be a lawyer. And ask me why, uh, no one in my family had ever been a lawyer. No one in my family had ever gone to college. A lot of people that I knew from the neighborhood would always get into trouble. I'm kind of wondering how this first podcast should go. And I thought we'd start off by, by telling you who I am, what I've done, and what I hope to do and accomplish by doing a podcast. I've been a lawyer for 45 years. I was born in Little Italy, right above Angelo's Restaurant. That was my first residence on Mulberry Street. And uh, shortly after that, uh, I grew up in a place called Knickerbocker Village, uh, what we called the Fourth Ward. Anybody who lived in the Fourth Ward knows what that is. <laughs> it was a great place to grow up and a very interesting place. A lot of things were happening in every different direction in the good old Fourth Ward. I went to Xavier High School, Fordham University. Uh, I studied at New York University Graduate School for a while and then went to New York Law School where I graduated in 1976. I became a legal aid lawyer for two or three years, about three years, and then I went into private practice and practiced starting in 1979 to the present time in the field of criminal defense. And during that course of time, I've been in a lot of big cases, and uh, I guess I've achieved a lot of memories. And, and part of what we'll be doing on this podcast will be to take you down memory lane uh, and take you through the back roads of the courthouse, through the back roads of Little Italy, through the back roads of uh, what the government calls the mafia. My intention in doing this is to be different than any other program that's ever talked about the so-called mafia. What do I mean by that? I mean that for decades, my whole lifetime, I've, the, every movie seems to be the same. Every documentary is almost the same. The black and white photos, the thumping music, thump, 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 and the bloody bodies all over the screen, and the famous so-called gangsters with the numbers under their, uh, on their chest, you know, the, 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 the numbers, which are their prison numbers, so to speak. It's always the same thing. It's always the same story, no matter who tells it. And a lot of times, these documentaries and these movies are actually inspired by law enforcement personalities. In recent years, you've had, uh, you've had all these informants and stool pigeons making substantial amounts of money telling their story, the inside story. But ladies and gentlemen, their story isn't the inside story. Their story is their story. Their story, which is designed to glorify themselves, make excuses for their own dastardly conduct, and to just make money, because that's what they're about. And the government goes along their merry way, pro profiting, profiting on this in their glorious prosecutions of organized crime, which are endless, which are endless. Some of them, as we inside the business, the lawyers know, um, and the defendants, just ridiculous from, from the beginning to the end. Some of their biggest cases have aspects to it that can make you laugh if you know what the truth is. And over the next weeks and months, maybe years, we'll be talking about cases like the commission case, like the Tommy Karate case, both of which I was very much involved in from beginning to end. 
uh, we'll talk about famous people, people that you've heard of, and you're going to get a different viewpoint. You're going to get the other side, right? The side that you never hear about. The side that the government doesn't tell you about. The side that the rats don't want you to know about. And we'll do all that without revealing any secrets and without betraying any confidence. And when this is all over, I don't know how long we'll be doing it. I hope that people will look upon this podcast with respect and not with disdain, like we see is the case with so much of the nonsense that's overwhelming the internet. It's kind of crazy. But how did I start on this idea? Let's, let's get back to who I am. 45 years in the criminal defense business. In addition to that, I've had a life, I call it an organizational life. I've been involved with charitable groups like the community mayors. I was the, the chairman of the board of directors of an organization that helped handicapped kids. I was the president of the Catholic Lawyers of New York. I was on the board of directors of many organizations, the county lawyers. I was the vice president of the criminal lawyers. Uh, I was active in Xavier High School. But, you know, I, I did all those things because I always wanted to have kind of an alter ego to being a criminal defense lawyer. And, you know, in time, there's almost a, a limit on what you can do with those kinds of things because. They all take up a lot of time. And I started eight years ago to do a radio program. And uh, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with organized crime. Um, I was a guest on many different TV and radio programs over the years talking about the law, talking about my cases, which are generally organized crime cases. But uh when I met up with uh, Frank Morano and Curtis Sliwa and John Tobacco, I got into the radio business and I was interested in current events and politics. And that's where I kind of uh, set out to, to make a mark. And uh, Murray Richmond, another very, very <laughs> fine criminal defense lawyer, he's probably at this point in time, the dean of all criminal defense lawyers. Murray Richmond is a great friend of mine and and Murray had me as his guest on his program. We talked about law maybe 30 times. I, I substituted for him about six times. And then Bill O'Shaughnessy of uh, WVOX Radio in New Rochelle, he asked me if I wanted to do a program. And I said, yes. And he said, what about law? And I said, no, I don't want to do anything about law. I want to do about current events. And uh, current events turned into politics. Politics turned into the revolutionary situation that, that we see and I talk about every week on WVOX, 1460 AM, WVOX.com. And because I want you to know what was the forerunner of this podcast, I, I just want to read off some of, the, some of the, uh, the notes that I have relating to what we're trying to do. The public is fascinated with the so-called mafia and its legends, its violence, its impact on American life, both on the screen and off. Many movies and documentaries have been made, but never has the story been told by a true insider. Not from law enforcement, not from turncoat traders, and not from dreamers and schemers, but from a man who is inside as inside can be without being a member of organized crime. Matthew J. Mary is an attorney who has been called the ultimate Mob lawyer, a title that he does not disclaim. Part one of his story is the overwhelming effort by the United States Department of Justice, in accordance with the mandate of the Presidential Commission on Organized Crime of 1966, quote, to obliterate organized crime from the face of the earth at all costs. Those are the three important words that make my blood boil. At all cost. The cost has been the loss of integrity 
of the federal criminal justice system and the prosecution and prostitution of constitutional values in order to prosecute Italian Americans that the government believed to be part of an organization that they dubbed the mafia. No other group was ever, ever investigated, prosecuted, and incarcerated in such a heavy-handed way. The arrogant and unlawful conduct of law enforcement and condoned by the courts allowed a culture, a culture to develop that was used far beyond organized crime. All of these laws, the RICO law, every other thing, oh, we're going to obliterate organized crime. They didn't take very long to use the same laws against businessmen, politicians, even church leaders. It's absolutely insane what this government has gotten away with through the years. And they've, they've, they've set out a path of destructing the integrity of the criminal justice system in their quest to obliterate organized crime at all costs. All of these tactics were perfected on the so-called mob cases, and they were later used against everyone, people in all walks of life. These tactics in the courts became so normal and so powerful that it even invaded the sanctity of a presidential campaign. Well, we'll get into that in some other uh, later date. What I want to do during this podcast is to offer a perspective as a witness to history, not only as a criminal defense lawyer with over four decades of frontline courtroom experience, but also as someone who was born in Little Italy in 1950 and through his life enjoyed the friendship of many of the men described by the government as bosses of the so-called five families. From the streets to the courthouse, there is a story that has never been told from an inside view. And that's what we're going to try to accomplish. And we're going to do it seriously. And we're going to do it maybe with the help of some guests. We're going to do it with a lot of humor. We're going to do it with some good stories that hurt no one, again, let me emphasize that you will never hear anything on this show that will betray any kind of confidence or uh, reveal anything that I've learned uh, as a lawyer about criminal activity. You know, that is a separate issue. Uh, Being a criminal defense lawyer is something that comes first and foremost in my line of integrity. So what's the other part of this? You know, we, we, we try to, when we first started out, one of the things that I want to expose in the government tactics includes what I call targeting. That, that, that means remolding the FBI squads to mirror these so-called families and crews and creating the rat system whereby mass murdering lifelong criminals They get to walk and to prosper in exchange for mostly false testimony. This is something that's become commonplace at the courthouse. And most of the public not only does not object to it, they don't even know what's going on or really care. Well, the government wants to obliterate organized crime at the expense of their own integrity. And I think that part of our story has to be how that has taken place and has taken hold of uh, the government's prosecutorial functions. So that's where we're going to go. And that's point one. The next issue uh, that I've explored very thoroughly is how the government's treatment of Italian Americans who are accused of crimes affects all the people who are not part of what the government says is organized crime. You say, well, what do you mean, Matt? What are you talking about? We don't understand that. Well, you better understand it because a lot of stuff 
has happened over the decades. And in, in my mission statement for a, a new Italian American organization, when I, when I try to project to other people who are not part of the criminal defense community, was that there are many Italian American organizations who celebrate the glorious culture, the history, and the accomplishments of Italians and Italian Americans, but none that actually defend Italian Americans who are under attack. Recently, the attack on Christopher Columbus has brought out the best in the Italian American community. Often we hear people take offense at the media for using negative words to defame Italian Americans like mafia, cosa nostra, our thing, and all that stuff. People get so upset about languages. You know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. That's pretty much my philosophy. Italian Americans are too concerned with language. Oh, we can't allow them to say that. But how about what the government of the United States has been doing for decades, okay? Uh, let me say this. Many Italian Americans, perhaps for fear of being stereotyped, have ignored the government actions on an organized basis, which has caused Italian Americans to be treated more differently in a negative way than any other American group, including African Americans who have fought back successfully against discrimination. As a criminal defense lawyer for over 40 years, 45 years to be exact, I have endured, endured seeing the federal justice system prostitute our constitutional values and the integrity of the justice system only to achieve their goals. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no goal that supersedes being fair and being just. And in my efforts to try to form a new Italian-American organization, uh, and pardon me for almost fearing to use the word organization, uh, I, I, I want to address three problems. Number one, Italian-Americans who are accused of crimes in federal courts are treated differently than other defendants in how they are targeted, investigated, prosecuted, sentenced, and how they are treated in prison and in the appellate courts. Number two, persons of Italian descent and heritage are deprived of jobs and actually removed from jobs because of their relationships or even minimal contact with persons that the government says have something to do with organized crime. That does not mean engaging in crime, but merely knowing someone or having a minimal contact, like going to a wedding with people who are suspected of being involved in organized crime. This is more prevalent than anyone can imagine in labor unions and how they are regulated by the government, and especially in political government creations like the Waterfront Commission of New York Harbor, which terrorize Italian-American employees and applicants in a manner which is incomparable to anything else going on in America. Believe me, I fought this fight for year after year after year of people not being able to work on the waterfront or being kicked off their jobs because they know someone, because they went to a wedding, they went to a party and some wise guy was there. Please, the America doesn't believe this. Other lawyers don't believe this. Other criminal lawyers who don't practice in federal court don't believe this. But it is just commonality. It's been happening for decades and decades. The third thing that I'd like to bring out with regard to all Italian Americans is that the aggressive attacks on anything related to Italians, like Christopher Columbus, John Cabot, whose real name is Giovanni Cabote, Amarico Vespucci, America is named after him. Giovanni da Veranzano, just to name a few heroes whose accomplishments, whose accomplishments are demeaned day after day just because they're Italians. They're mocked no matter what they did or who they are. They've got, they, those, those four have nothing to do with organized crime. Huh. They were dead and buried before anyone ever thought 
of that catchphrase. These things have been going on for decades because successful, successful Italian Americans let it happen for fear of being attacked as guilty by association. Until the most prominent Italian Americans in the country come together to question what is happening, has happened, and might continue to happen, we, the strongest people in America, the most patriotic and law abiding in America, we fade into history as a people afraid to be strong and just and to do demand that Italians, good and bad, be treated like everyone else and not in any special negative category. So that's the primary mission that I'd hope to accomplish by trying to create an Italian American organization. So why do I tell you about all of these efforts which never actually reach fruition? Because that's why we're here. Well, that's the primary reason we're here. We're here to have fun, that's for sure. And I hope in the next weeks and months and years, we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to talk about a lot of things that are going to surprise you and make you laugh and make you think. But we're not going to forget that no one, but no one, is committed to exposing mafia mythology. No one is committed to debunking all of this mafia folklore that's been created and, 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 and written in stone by the government, adopted by the media, and just totally transforming Italian Americans into something that they're not, okay? And until we start doing something about it as legitimate Italians to try to set the record straight, if we keep ignoring it, we're all going to be taken under by the current of prejudice that exists in this country. And believe me, other groups have fought successfully. And I can tell you that I've been part of helping other groups fight discrimination successfully. And okay, here we are. So we're going to talk about all that stuff in the coming weeks. And uh, we're going to talk about some lighthearted stuff. We're going to talk about my cases. We're going to talk about the other cases that I've <laughs> observed from the sidelines for f over four decades. We're going to talk about the streets. We're going to talk about some characters that you've, you've seen in movies that I knew personally and who are not what they were portrayed to be on the big screen. So this is just to give you an idea of where we're going to give you just a rough idea as to our game plan, all right? Uh, and I think that's about it for our first podcast.